Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Fantastic. Let's try it one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ah, that's more like it. It's so wonderful to be here. I'm, I'm excited to get to share some thoughts with you today about the state of the college. It's been an absolutely incredible year. Together, we have learned so much. Um, there has been so much growth. And when you think about the commitment and creativity of faculty and staff, at the college is just omnipresent. It's fortified by a remarkable passion for student success and a determination to meet students where they are. The enthusiasm that I see every day around access, completion, and post-completion success is just absolutely exhilarating. So, as we channel our energies to preparing students for their futures, the college's transformation is also part of this journey. You know, there are new economic, social, and technological realities which are changing the work that we do at warp speeds. These elements mean that we have to adapt more efficiently, experiment more quickly, and make agility itself an essential learning outcome. The knowledge economy is being replaced by the creative economy. Now, knowledge is not the only requirement for success. Right? I'll talk more about that in a moment. For now, let's look a little more closely at the speed of change. It is argued that there has been no time in history that the speed of technological changes has impacted our society and the nature of work more profoundly than this moment. Here's an example. How many of you have heard of the following jobs when you were in high school? Right. Digital marketing specialist, social media app developer, wind turbine technician, big data scientist, information security analyst. I, I know what some people are thinking. This is obviously it's going to depend on when and where you attended uh, high school, of course. Um, but I think you get the point. These are jobs which have grown into being because of other technology. We didn't need wind turbine technicians until we were able to harness the power of the wind. We didn't need social media app developers before we had social media. We didn't need an artificial intelligence counter AI developer until we had artificial intelligence at the maturity that we currently do. We are in the midst of a new acceleration in technology. One common data point cited frequently is that 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030 haven't been invented yet. So new jobs are being created while many current jobs are changing dramatically. That means we have to work differently to prepare students. In many instances, much of what they will learn will be on the job. Some of them may transition to a completely different job than the one for which we're currently preparing them for. And they will need to excel. One of the fundamentals of the workforce of the future will be knowing how to learn. A report by Dell Technologies described it this way. The pace of change will be so rapid that people will learn in the moment using new technologies such as augmented reality and virtual reality. The ability to gain new knowledge will be more valuable than the knowledge itself. This is a profound observation. For people who teach knowledge, there is something fundamental shifting under our feet. The nature of preparation for the workforce is transforming. Our aspirations as educators must be equally transformational. Let us look back at that statement once again. The ability to gain new knowledge will be more valuable than the knowledge itself. This is a dynamic that can create a range of responses. Empowerment comes to mind. 
So does exhilaration. So does intimidation. The empowering part is that the best human jobs, usually those with family-sustaining wages, will have more room for creative thought and strategy. People will work more closely with technology, which will free them to do more of the uniquely human work, like creative solutions that cross disciplines, strategies that rely on human connections in communities, leveraging humanities and social sciences to ensure ethics in decision making, and designs that blend both aesthetics with function. Human thought is more than data collection and processing. It involves layers of understanding and synthesis. We are sentient beings. We are frequently driven by motives that are complex. We can be impacted by experience in nuanced ways. And we bring with us varying cultural and social experiences that shape the way in which we see the world and interact. Only other humans truly appreciate that. So, humans will continue to occupy places and spaces at the most sophisticated levels of our society. Their contributions will also be essential to societal level impacts, such as promoting the public good. But we will be freed from some of the work that technology can do accurately, reliably, and more quickly. Those who possess the skills to embrace this new normal and operate in this new world will fill these more advanced roles. As the college steps into its next chapter, guided by the new strategic plan, we must prepare our students for this fast-paced society which is fueled by rapid technological change. Notice, I did not specifically mention preparing students for jobs. In fact, the paradigm of occupational identity is already shifting. In the future economy, people may identify themselves by clusters of skills rather than specific job classifications. The crux of this change is adaptation. Throughout a lifetime, skill sets will identify people more than traditional titles. The takeaway is that students must know how to learn. Learn fast and learn continuously. This will help ensure that they always have skills to work in areas that pay family sustaining wages. This ability to learn will also help students be civically engaged and contribute to the public good. The only way we can do this, though, is if they start with solid, fundamental skill sets. Such skill sets are currently rooted in credentials we have, that we offer, right? And which they open the door to employment. Continued employment that earns a family sustaining wage though will also depend on students' capacities for adaptation. So our mission as educators has acquired a new element. Not only must we prepare students with skills to contribute on an economic, social, and community plane, we must deliver them in a new context. Right? For us to do this successfully, we have to recommit to access completion and post-completion success through the lenses of these new conditions. Access. Access is about expanding the conversation beyond affordability, although that is very important. It's about the expectation that young people attend college regardless of whether their parents went to college or they immigrated a few years ago or they have to work to support a family or any other variables or characteristics. This expectation is critical. It is built by saturating our community with experiences of the college, providing support early and creating a path that resonates with each learner. 
our partnerships with MCPS are pillars of this strategy. Thousands of students from MCPS come to one of our campuses each year for day-long events or summer camps or experiential learning. With that said, there are approximately 160,000 students in MCPS, as well as students who are homeschooled or attend private school. So we have a great opportunity to purposefully engage many more individuals. Access, it's also about our local nonprofit partners, such as Identity, FutureLink, Ethiopian Community Center, and Career Catchers, who help us reach a spectrum of learners. Social service partners, like the Housing Opportunity Commission and the Montgomery County Department of Corrections, draw in people whom we must engage differently. While we have committed partners, certainly there is immense opportunity for deeper interconnections. We miss people who can't afford to take off work or who have childcare needs or basic needs and security or can't access Pell because they are incarcerated. We need to fill in those holes so that college going is the norm. Uh, let me be clear, and be extremely clear. We have many initiatives at the college that speak to these opportunities. Those that are successful need to be scaled up dramatically so we can have the impact for which we are striving to serve all residents who can benefit from Montgomery College. Right? When we think about completion, we know that more than ever, the educational experiences of students will determine their success in the evolving, skilled job market and in society. Their classroom experiences should be creative and collaborative. This will prepare them for a professional world in which people work together and grow skills on the job. In the workplaces of the future, learning will be continuous and experts will bring their knowledge to shared solutions. In addition, data literacy and media literacy will be essential skills in the workforce as technology also enables more credible content and facilitates disinformation. The next generation will need to identify such content and control for its impact on our communities before it creates havoc. These skills will be prerequisites for the civically engaged individuals we are preparing to contribute to the public good. In some ways, our society is cinching itself together more tightly. As technology integrations become more standard, the accountability of public and private businesses will grow. We're already seeing this in the market as corporations have been forced to decrease their carbon footprints and prioritize equity and inclusion. We also see this in the ESG framework that companies are starting to take. This is a strategy of environmental, social, and governance that is embedded into decision making that considers all stakeholders, employees, customers, et cetera, instead of solely focusing on profit margins. As technology shrinks the distance between consumers and creators, the expectation of faster adaptations to consumer preferences has already evolved. This expectation also means faster adaptation by workers. Right? We all have to learn more quickly and be more agile. This also means continuous learning after college. Faculty and staff have deep knowledge of the college. The college will rely on you to construct the framework that will serve us best. This framework will be embedded and shaped by the student experience. We see a lot of this in our new strategic plan. You will be at the fore of preparing students to understand 
critical paradigm shifts. Their capacities for collaboration will be even more important. So, how we teach content will be a lesson itself in learning how to learn and problem solving in teams. So, how do we equip ourselves and our distinct roles to impart these lessons? Right? As teachers, counselors, support staff, every role at the college. We will need to be more curious and explorational. Right? We will need to try more new technology and pedagogy. We need to continue to be equity focused. We'll need to think more deeply about what practices and procedures, official and unofficial, need to be changed to advance our strategic plan goals. I've heard so many great ideas. I can't count. So many in conversations across the college about how we can remove barriers and alter current practices. From IT to financial aid, from facilities to marketing, from advising to international services, from classroom experiences to student groups and more. I've heard from so many of you. I want to encourage each person here in every position, in every role, to experiment, to follow your curiosity. These elements should become part of our fundamental culture. That creativity that I mentioned as essential to new jobs in the economy should be part of our everyday jobs and roles here at the college. The college already has areas of excellence in this respect. Adapting to fit the needs of our students and our communities has created experiential learning opportunities like the rolling Raptor truck, right? alternative spring break in Puerto Rico, a hydroponics tower for the MC Go Green Club on the Germantown campus. Meeting students with unique life circumstances has produced two exemplary programs this year alone. The alternative teaching certification serves students of early childhood education with a $1.4 million grant this year from the Maryland State Department of Education. The TechMap program created learning pathways for IT for underserved people with a $1.6 million in funding from this year from the Department of Labor. Several other programs are helping students learn English while learning academic content or valuable training skills. The My Best model is at work in three classes this semester, Phlebotomy, Networking Plus, and Early Childhood Education, where students are taught English and a skilled trade simultaneously. We also have a pilot of instruction this spring in which bilingual professors are responding to questions in two languages in order to accelerate content among students whom English is not their first language. All of these programs respond to equitable learner needs, local employer needs, and the socioeconomic needs of our students. The results are win-win-win, right? Our focus should be to eliminate equity gaps and simultaneously enhance outcomes for all groups. While we understand the value of grants that we are awarded, our impact must be more comprehensive. The scale that we need is greater. We need to ensure all students are provided with opportunities to thrive. All students means all students. Regardless of discipline, length of program, micro-credential, certification, certificate, etc., all students. Each academic area should begin to see how it is mapped to the goals of the new strategic plan. Our circumstances demand 
an enhanced and at times different approach to access, completion, and post-completion success. That's why we're standing up our East County Education Center with classes in nursing and cybersecurity, allied health, and more. That's why we'll continue to advocate for Montgomery College to offer bachelor's degrees. That's why MC's e-learning, innovation, and teaching excellence Elite has created an AI series on the future of teaching and learning in the digital age. Not only will instructors have to understand how artificial intelligence impacts student assessment, they will have to use it to plan lessons and evaluate learning. They will also have to guide students through questions of digital literacy as artificial intelligence creates more and more and more content. I think you can see that the speed with which technology is impacting society and changing learning is remarkable. To keep up with it and really to, to stay ahead of it, the college must accelerate its own pace continuously. So students are prepared to hit the ground running in the workplace. Some technologies of tomorrow in 2023 will be stale in 2025 when some students begin work. How do we, how do we bridge that gap? We scale up initiatives that show promise. We create new initiatives when needed. We combine initiatives that are duplicative. And we stop initiatives that are not yielding the results that lead to transformational change at scale. We assess along the way, formatively, right, to make needed changes without waiting until it's too late. Simultaneously, we examine data more meticulously to assess the impact of programs. We must look more carefully at initiatives and data trends that show promise. For example, first time ever in college students who meet with an advisor multiple times have a much greater rate of completion. First time ever in college students who meet with an advisor multiple times have a much greater rate of completion. In this group, for full-time students, the rate of completion jumps 20 percentage points if they meet with an advisor seven times over nine months, compared to students who don't meet with an advisor at all, 20 percentage points. Among part-time students, the rate jumps 34 percentage points, comparing a student who has seven meetings to a student with zero. How do we scale up this impact? We need to examine how we are channeling students into programs that offer financial and academic support that we know advance completion. And we need to identify and create a framework so every student experiences engagement opportunities that we know will positively correlate to success. How do we make this work? Efforts that directly impact a certain cohort of students are great. They are wonderful. What we need moving forward are scalable efforts that create systems change. Not some students, all students. To accomplish this, we need systems thinking. That relies on a culture of ideas and timely feedback. We need to nurture this environment. We must be open to pivoting when outcomes look great. Right? Let's dive in deeper, faster. We must always have student success on our radar. How do we best serve marginalized students? If something is demonstrably working well, let's scale it up. Let's make the impact on students systemic and transformational. And when I say students, in case you're not picking up on this, I mean all students. If the clarion call of equity with which we have heard amplified in the last couple of years is to become a commitment that we fill, 
then all students will need to be impacted. The infrastructure will have to be transformational. That's why we are asking for input on the facilities master plan because you know best what labs and lecture halls and technology integrations students will need. You have thought about and understand and know what facilities can provide to enhance our community partnerships. Pedagogy also has to be transformational. That's why we are already linking every discipline at the college to a component of experiential learning. I think the process of doing this has made it even more clear how rapid change is progressing. Finally, we talk about post-completion success. Right? Has to be given the attention it warrants. Family sustaining wages among our students must be an outcome of our formula for success. Lives that are transformed by opportunity must be part of our data-informed decision-making. Right? You can see that on this slide right here. Individual economic and social mobility that lead to intergenerational mobility are the ultimate goals. They are the only ways to reduce the enormous poverty gaps across different racial groups that exist in our midst. The ones that keep families working and living below subsistence wages for decades. Family sustaining wages will transform family life and our shared communities. And in order to plan to actualize these results, we have to plan for them. We have to make use of data that wasn't always available, such as wage data from the Maryland Longitudinal Data System, which allows us to track income from graduates who work in Maryland. We have to use such metrics to confirm that we are serving our students and, and we're already doing this at some new levels. Right? We have to create even more partnerships that allow us to fill gaps in the data. Here are some of the areas in which we're partnering to get even more access to data and filling gaps. We also need to encourage civic engagement among our students and our community. If higher education is a public good, which we all know it is, it should produce a cohort of civically engaged residents. It should nurture a pipeline of leaders who want to grow opportunity for everyone because they benefited from it. We should produce residents who work against racial and social injustices and promote equity because the culture at MC showed them how valuable those assets are in a diverse democracy. So, so let me step back for a moment to the role of knowledge in our new framework. The knowledge economy was a pillar of the late 20th century. The creative economy is the next evolution. It's no longer knowledge in a silo. It's knowledge plus partners plus ideas plus implementation. If we embrace this in our classrooms, our counseling offices, our community centers, and all throughout our college, we will all maximize our human and technological potential in new and different ways. We will grow our capacities as we deepen our knowledge and skills. As I close, I want to leave you with the voices of a few of our students and two alumni. They were asked to talk about their experiences of MC and, and what, what served them. Their experiences of MC and what served them. How faculty and staff adapted to their needs. How the college provided tools and support that helped them carve their path. I think you will see that these students, they face some barriers, yes indeed, many of which were torn down by faculty and staff. They also took advantage 
of opportunities at the college. Well, I am confident that we can find ways to serve even more students, like those who you'll meet in a few moments. As you watch, please keep your eyes out for ways in which MC enables students to take advantage of opportunity. Nobody in my family has gone to college. Um, I come from a family of immigrants from El Salvador, so this is very new to all of us. And it's actually also one of the reasons that I chose to come to Montgomery College, because we weren't too educated on the types of financial aid available to us and the scholarships or any of the stuff I could apply to in high school to get some financial support if I wanted to go to another school. I wanted to save money and I am definitely doing so by starting at MC and then transferring. Another factor was definitely location. I can commute and I have other responsibilities at home. So I feel like attending MC gives me the opportunity to keep those responsibilities and doing them well while still studying. So I really like that. And when I was looking for courses to take, I could only think of my local community college. Now, what I did not know is that you had that biotechnology program, which blew my mind away because I knew it would be an easy transition to come into from a biology field. I went to high school back in Colombia, so I didn't have any SATs. Uh, so they already had a um, structure, very organized like path for foreigners to be able to pursue and continue uh, their education. I didn't intend to be a communication major, but um, during my senior year, I completed this uh, CCMA program where I got my, I was certified uh, with my clinical, as a clinical medical assistant. Um, but I figured out that I didn't like that. That, that was not my passion. And during the pandemic, uh, my parents both uh, lost their job. So we started a clothing business and I plan on taking my communications degree to help expand our business. Macklin Business Institute has been great. Um, it's all centered around experiential learning and um, we have an entrepreneurial leadership program that we host in our program. It's called Anactus and we have a bunch of different projects. For example, the Starbucks on campus is our business that we run. Um, as a learning experience where we do marketing, operations, accounting. The Renaissance Scholars Program, they have just supported me. They've given me opportunities. They've, like, I mean, multiple professors that I've had meet with me one-on-one, -on -one, go over my writing, go over how I'm presenting myself in class, how I'm going about things. It, it's just every step along the way, people have been there to support me academically, socially as well, like through so social programs. There's one program called Impact MC that I'm in, which kind of helps with like that thing of volunteering and being an active member of the community. Financial support, uh, I have received it from the ACES family, also the MC Raptor uh, scholarship, I believe, which has helped me just focus on my education and not worry so much about my financial situation. I have gotten different kinds of support from MC. I have gotten financial aid. Um, and I would say that a, pro a program that I really do appreciate is ACES. And I just loved having that support because I am a first generation student, so I don't have that help from, say, my parents. So having other people who have already gone through the process help me is amazing. I love it. My professors do a great job of weaving in a lot of content from outside of Montgomery College, like videos or textbooks or things of that nature. So I think classes are kind of set up in a way where you get a comprehensive idea of whatever you're learning about. And I think that's very practical for people once they move on from Montgomery College because they'll have an idea of what the world thinks or what the outside thinks, not just what's going on here. It's always good to keep your doors open and be open to new ideas and MC is I think a great place to do that. I'm grateful to have um, completed my two years as I did with great classes, great professors, counselors, and experiences that were invaluable. I had not gotten any interviews the entire time before entering into the boot camp 
And within two weeks of being at the boot camp, I received my first interview, my first job offer. And before the boot camp ended, I had so many interview requests that I had to turn them away. I got a fellowship at Johns Hopkins University this past summer. I was there for 10 weeks, I think. I was living on campus. I was doing research, which was directly correlated with what I was doing in um, my classes, like my honors classes. I, my professors are the ones who recommended it to me. They wrote recommendations for me for the program. I literally used materials from our class in my research project. So it literally just felt like a seamless transition into that. MC is very committed uh, to their students, to their growth and their progress. They do anything in their power for us to succeed. Montgomery College saved my life, literally and figuratively. You don't know the pressures of suddenly losing your job. Your job is your worth. And when you don't have your means of income, it, it can take a toll on your well-being. So to stumble across a program that is complementary of the Department of Labor, that you don't have to come out of your pocket for, that the only thing it cost me was maybe 10 minutes of a commute, it was really, really a blessing and a godsend. And I thank Montgomery College for stepping in and helping me towards my career goals as they did. All right, everybody wants that video. I know, right? It's just it's a, so as as we saw in in this video, internships, experiential learning, and cohort learning are, are, are levelers, right? They, they make the entire MC experience more relevant to the world around us. Such experiences prepare students for employment in the creative economy where they are team members and leaders who rely on technology to forge solutions more quickly and accurately. They create more lasting impacts for our communities. Now, I, I asked you to to look at some things, and I, I know you were watching, I hope you kept, try to keep track. I, I hope you noticed how many benefits these students took advantage of. Right? Someone, someone in our midst helped Viviana to get a NIST internship. Someone told Kimberly about ACEs. Someone steered Luis to computational biology. One of you told Maddie about the Macklin Business Institute, while another help Lisa move from unemployment to the biotech boot camp. Someone helped Norman edit his Jack Kent Cook Scholars application. Your work created these stories and so many more like them. They are the ones that are making the college's impact transformational. It is this type of impact, this type of experience that we need to provide for all students. I want to say thank you for treating students as whole people. Each one of us also deserves that grace. I have conversations with a lot of folks um, and I'm appreciative of each and every one of them. I know that um, we're all trying to manage health, wellness, life, work, integration. And I know it can, it can be a stretch. A stretch and strain in, in ways that we don't think of at times. I know this personally. I'm, I'm there with you. Um, I want to encourage empathy and compassion as we accelerate our efforts and also continue to nurture a workplace of dignity and acceptance. You are valued. You are all so very much appreciated. Thank you all so very much. Thank you for everything you do day in and day out and your dedication to Montgomery College. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.